This chapter 16 deals with the endocrine system. Uh, the endocrine system is going to be uh, one of their communication systems within the body and so um, deals with the secretion of hormones and if you can understand that then obviously you can then understand when there are abnorm abnormalities that happen and the resulting effects of that and then how to treat your patients. So I said the endocrine system is one of two communication systems. The other communication system is your nervous system, which tends to respond very quickly to a stimulus, but the response is also very short-lived. The endocrine system, by contrast, will respond much slower than the nervous system would, but the result is going to be much longer lasting. So there's times when you need a very quick response. Right now, that's it. You're done. And the nervous system takes care of that. But the endocrine system is when you need to have that response lasting for a longer period of time. Endocrinology is that study of the hormones and the effect of the hormones, what happens if you're producing too much or too little, uh, studying the endocrine organs that are secreting these hormones, and all of the uh, various results from that. The endocrine system as a whole is going to uh, be involved and help regulate certain things such as reproduction, growth and development. It's going to play a huge role in helping to maintain the proper balance of water and your electrolytes, electrolytes such as sodium, calcium, potassium. All this has to be maintained within certain levels to maintain homeostasis. Uh, the endocrine system is also going to be involved with regulation of cellular metabolism, that balance with energy, and also does play a role with uh, the defense that the body has. There's two types of glands. There's exocrine glands and endocrine glands. Exocrine glands, if you remember from way back uh, studying the, the integumentary system, you may remember that the exocrine glands have ducts. Uh, that will help to carry the whatever is being secreted in that gland, such as say oils, to the membrane surface. So it's made in the gland and then it's secreted through the duct work and onto the surface. What is being secreted are non-hormonal substances, like say sweat, oil, saliva. Endocrine glands produce hormones and they are ductless. So they'll just be secreted from the gland and usually will be then transported via the blood to the target cells. There are several different endocrine glands such as the pituitary, the thyroid, parathyroid, uh, adrenal, and pineal glands. The hypothalamus is classified as a neuroendocrine organ because it functions both within the nervous system as well as the endocrine system. And then some of the glands have both exocrine and endocrine functions, such as with the pancreas, the placenta, your gonads. There are other tissues that can also produce hormones, such as some of your adipose cells, the thymus. Um, you'll have certain cells associated with the small intestines, stomach, kidneys, and the heart as well. So this picture is showing you uh, drawing of where the various endocrine organs are within the body. As you can see, there are several glands that are in the, uh, the brain and then in the thoracic cavity and down below pelvic cavities. So hormones are going to be those chemicals that are released from the gland. You can think of them as chemical messengers. Like I said, they will travel in the blood. Some of them will travel also in the lymph until they reach their target cell, which they will bind to a receptor and then trigger the appropriate response. Very broadly, there's two types or classes of hormones. There are those that your book classifies them as amino acid-based hormones. Sometimes you'll see them classified as protein. Hormones. Now proteins are made up of amino acids, so you can use the other term. And the other class are steroids. Um, 
it's there is another group, the eicosanoids, which some people consider those hormones, but some of them uh, do not. Now, when the hormone is secreted, as I said, uh, it will bind to receptors on the target cell. So what's going to happen when it binds to it? It depends on the hormone you're talking about in the, the target cell. Sometimes it will affect the permeability of that plasma membrane. Uh, sometimes it may change the membrane resting potential by either opening or closing some of your ion gates. Sometimes it may trigger the synthesis of other enzymes or additional proteins. Sometimes it may deactivate enzymes. Sometimes it may activate them. Sometimes it may induce uh, activity triggering the secretion of other compounds. And it may stimulate mitosis. So there's a wide variety of effects that it can have. The level of hormones in the blood is going to be controlled by negative feedback systems. Remember, this is where you're going to get the opposite effect. So if the concentration, the hormone level in the blood starts to increase really high, the negative feedback system, the way it's going to work is that increased concentration actually is going to turn around and trigger the gland stop secreting this hormone. The levels are high enough. So if the levels get too high, it's going to decrease, shut down, turn off the secretion. Of if levels drop really low, then it's going, the negative feedback system triggers it. Okay, we need to increase now. So it's going to be the opposite effect. How is the hormone release triggered? It can be triggered either by endocrine gland stimulation or nervous system modulation. Endocrine gland stimuli, there are several different things that can stimulate the endocrine gland to synthesize, or make the hormone, and then also release it. It can be uh, humoral stimuli, neural stimuli, or hormonal stimuli. The humoral stimuli, this has to do with changing blood levels of ions and nutrients. Uh, such an example is calcium decline declining or decreasing blood calcium concentration is going to stimulate the parathyroid gland to secrete parathyroid hormone. What is that hormone going to do? Ultimately, it's going to cause the calcium concentration to increase in the blood. As that, that calcium level, in calcium is an ion, so as that concentration increases, then that's going to then inhibit the release of the parathyroid hormone. So when we're talking about humoral stimuli, it has to do with ions or nutrients that in this particular example, it's the concentration of calcium that's triggering the stimulation of the release of the parathyroid hormone. And this is just a diagram showing this, uh, that as that calcium level decreases, then it stimulates the parathyroid hormone to be released, that triggers the, the final response is going to be increased calcium levels in the blood. Neural stimuli is when you have nerve fibers that are going to be uh, stimulating the release. It's oftentimes the sympathetic nervous system, such as with the uh, adrenal gland, in which it will stimulate it to uh, release the uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine that are located in the adrenal gland. So that is going to be stimulated by uh, the nervous system. Hormonal stimuli, oftentimes what we see is that one hormone receives a stimulus to be released. So the, the endocrine gland gets the stimulus, it releases hormone A. Hormone A then acts as a stimulus for the release of hormone B. And so as we often see, it's, it's a stepwise or a cascade type process. A is stimulated, it stimulates B, B may stimulate C, and so it's a stepwise process. Um, we often see with the hormones from the hypothalamus, 
tend to stimulate the release of a lot of the hormones in the anterior, anterior pituitary gland. And then some of those are going to stimulate hormones elsewhere in the body. And so, um, like I said, think of it kind of like a, a cascade. And that's what this diagram is showing, how the hypothalamus is stimulating hormones in the anterior pituitary. There are several different hormones produced in the anterior pituitary gland. And this is just showing an example of three of them of how one may go stimulate the thyroid gland to release additional hormones there, or the adrenal cortex and stimulate release of hormones there, or uh, the gonads and males, the testes, females, the ovaries, and then those also then release hormones. The final hormone is going to act as an inhibitor back up to the hypothalamus to tell, okay, enough, you can shut off now. The nervous system can make adjustments to the hormone levels when needed. It can either stimulate or inhibit the uh, action of the endocrine glands. So you may have normal controls, <coughs> but then the nervous system can override that. When would this happen? If you're under severe stress, um, if you're in suddenly placed in a, a uh, situation where your body is detecting that potential crisis situation, like where the sympathetic nervous system is kicked on in that fight or flight, then the nervous system is going to take over and override the controls of the endocrine system. It's all about survival. The target cells, these are the cells that the hormone is going to bind to receptors on those. So most of the hormones will have certain specific cells that they will stimulate or have some type of effect on. How is that that um, your antidiuretic hormone is going to affect cells in the kidneys? Why does it affect cells in your skin? Because your skin does not have those uh, very specific receptors on the surface of the cells. If you remember way back when you first reviewed what a cell looked like, there are protein receptors that extend out on the outer surface of cells. And these vary between cells. So your skin cells can be different from the muscle, which is different from the kidney, which is different from the liver, etc. Well, these receptors, they're like docking stations. So it's very specific as to what can bind to it. Hormones can bind to those receptors. So that's how you distinguish what the target cell is. If a target, if a cell has a receptor for hormone A, then it becomes a target cell for hormone A. The hormone can bind to the receptor and then trigger the appropriate response. If you don't have that receptor for hormone A, then that hormone A is not going to do anything to that cell. It's going to have absolutely no response. It's not going to bind anywhere on it, and it's just going to move on its merry way. So that's how you have the specificity of what hormone can act on what cell. The cell, the target cell, must have that specific receptor to the hormone that it can bind to. How do you activate the target cell? Well, it's going to depend on three different things. Number one, how many receptors do you have on that target cell? If you only have one per cell, the activation is going to be a little bit harder than if you had, say, 50 receptors on the target cell. You have a better chance of the hormone binding to it. Then. What are the levels or concentration of the hormone in the blood itself at any particular time? It's going to change over time. The level of hormone right now might be very different than what it was 20 minutes ago. It might be very different in five minutes, depending on the situation you're in and what's going on. So if the blood levels of the hormone are very low, chances of it being able to bind to the receptor are going to be lower than if you have higher levels of the blood hormone. 
So the, the blood levels, the number of receptors, and then third would be the what we call affinity. That's the strength of the binding between the receptor and the hormone. How, how well do, are they attracted and physically bind to each other? So I said the amount of hormone um, can influence the number of receptors for that hormone. Uh, target cells that form more receptors in response to low, to low hormone levels, that's called upregulation. Downregulation is when some of the target cells might lose some of the receptors. Why? Because you have very high hormone levels. You don't want that high of a response. So it's like desensitizing. Um, you don't want them to constantly be overreacting because there's this, this high, consistent concentration of the hormone. We're going to look at the various glands and which uh, hormones they do uh, produce and secrete, what the target cells are. The best way I have found for studying the endocrine system is if you were to make a chart. And in the first column, write the gland. What's the name of the gland? In the next column, write the hormone that that gland produces. And then in the third column, write the target cell. Where is it going to bind to? And then in the fourth column, what's the effect or what's the function of that hormone? What is it going to do when it binds to that target cell? By making a chart, having it all in one place, I think will help you um, with learning and studying the various uh, hormones. So we're going to start with the hypothalamus. It is in the brain. You should already be familiar with it from the nervous system. As I said, the very beginning of this, it's um, a component or it plays a role with both the nervous system and the endocrine system. And we do see this periodically with different organs that they, they're not just solely with one system. They may function in, in a variety of systems. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland by um, a thin stalk. It's called the infibidulum. The pituitary is also a gland that is going to secrete several different hormones, eight different hormones. It has two lobes. It has a posterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary. Now, the posterior pituitary is composed of neural tissue, and the anterior pituitary is consist, uh, composed of glandular tissue. Now, there are nerves that have uh, a connection from the hypothalamus to the uh, pituitary. <coughs> Those nerves are going to run through that infibidula. The hypothalamus actually, it's kind of an interesting thing, it actually secretes two hormones that are considered as neurohormones. Um, so the, the hormones are produced in the hypothalamus, but they're not going to be stored there. They will actually travel down the nerves and be stored in the posterior pituitary, and then it's going to be released into the uh, circulatory system, into the blood from there. The two neurohormones are oxytocin and what is abbreviated as ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So as I said, this diagram is showing at the top you've got your hypothalamus. The, um, in the hypothalamus is where you are going to produce the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone. Once they are produced, as you can see, they're going to travel down those nerves through the infibidulum, that's that stalk, that connects down to the pituitary. They will move to the posterior lobe, the posterior pituitary, and they will be stored there until they re receive a stimulus for release. So you can see they've been transported down and then stored in the pituitary. And that's where some people get confused. Uh, 
want to say that these two hormones are produced in the posterior pituitary? No, they're only stored there. They're actually produced by the in the hypothalamus. The anterior lobe, uh, the anterior pituitary, is composed of a set of glandular tissue, so it is going to be producing hormones there. Now, the release of the hormones from the anterior pituitary is going to be pretty much controlled by the hypothalamus. It can stimulate the release. It can also inhibit the hormone uh, release from the <coughs> anterior pituitary. So depending on what the stimulus is, it comes from the hypothalamus, travels down to the anterior pituitary, and triggers the release there. Now, uh, I'm going to mention the eight hormones associated with the pituitary gland. Remember that the first two that we already talked about, oxytocin and ADH, were actually made in the hypothalamus stored in the posterior pituitary. Now, in the anterior pituitary is where you have the remaining six hormones that are being uh, produced and then secreted in response to stimuli from the hypothalamus. These six hormones are the growth hormone, and you'll notice that we tend to abbreviate uh, the names of the hormones. So as you're studying, uh, be familiar with both the abbreviation but also the full name. So you've got the growth hormone, the thyroid stimulating hormone, the adrenal cortotrophic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and prolactin. Now, if we look at oxytocin, uh, one of the main things it's um, associated with is that it is a stimulus for contractions of the uterus. So this hormone is released during childbirth, and it responds to positive feedback. In other words, it's released, it starts the uh, contractions of the uterus, those contractions are then going to stimulate additional release of oxytocin, which triggers an even stronger contraction. The stronger contraction continues to stimulate even, stimulate even more release of the oxytocin, and then getting even stronger contractions. And so positive feedback is where whatever response you're getting is just going to keep increasing. And this increases until uh, childbirth actually occurs. Oxytocin is also uh, one of the triggers for um, release of the milk ejection, nursing mothers. ADH, or the antidiuretic hormone, uh, this is going to be responding to solute concentration. Solute is what is dissolved in the solution. We have a body. What is dissolved in the water? If the concentration of the solute is too high, in essence, what that's telling you is that the water level is low. And so it's going to trigger the, the release of the ADH. What that, the ADH is going to do, it is going to affect the target cells that are in the kidneys and the tibials of the kidneys that are responsible for reabsorbing water. What happens in the kidneys, and we'll get to this later in the semester, the kidneys act as a filtration. And so as the blood's coming through the kidneys, it's going to remove most everything out of the blood and then slowly back, add back into the blood what's needed at that particular time. How much water is added back into the blood essentially depends on whether or not the person is well hydrated. Excess water then, as it pulls the water out of the blood, it's forming the urine. So if you have excess fluid, you're well hydrated, you have maybe excess fluid, then essentially you're going to produce more urine. You're going to pee more to get rid of that excess fluid. If you're dehydrated, the reverse is going to happen. The ADH, antidiuretic hormone, 
in response to this dehydration is going to be secreted, basically target the kidney cells saying, do not release a lot of the water. We need to reabsorb it. When we talk about reabsorbing it, we need to uh, put it back, this water, as you're forming the urine, pull the water out and put it back in the blood so that you remain hydrated. Yes, you would have less urine production then, but you don't want to lose more fluid. If you're dehydrated, you don't want to lose any more fluid. You've already lost enough. I know that some people look at this and they're like, wait a minute, okay, concentration of the solute is too high. How does that mean that you're getting dehydrated? Think of a glass of lemonade. Let's say you have, uh, you're making lemonade from a powdered mix. If you're um, only supposed to put in one scoop of the powder into a, a regular eight ounce glass of water, and you mix it, that would be under normal conditions. Well, say you weren't paying attention, or maybe you asked your young child or young niece or nephew who decided, oh, let's put about four scoops of powder in here. Still on eight ounces. It's Number one, it's going to be really strong lemonade. Why? Because that concentration, the solute, the, the, the lemonade powder would be the solute. And it would be really, really high, really concentrated in there. What do you need to do to get things back the way it's supposed to be and it would taste normal? You'd have to add more water. So the solute concentration would be really high. If you had, need to add more water to that, then you need to add more water to the glass, not pour water down the sink. And that's kind of what the kidneys are doing. That's kind of the way antidiuretic hormone is going to work. You're monitoring in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, if you remember from studying the nervous system, plays a huge role in maintaining homeostasis. How is that? Because it has different receptors that are monitoring so many different things, usually in the blood. And that's where it's monitoring the solute concentrations. So it starts to see those solute concentrations get higher and higher and higher. You're now starting to reach the upper limit of that homeostatic range. So how are you going to get the solute concentration down? How are you going to get that really strong lemonade down to a normal flavor? Add more water. And that's what you need to do. How are you going to add more water? Tell the kidneys, stop making so much urine. Don't release so much water in your, basically in your pee. Put it, that water back into the blood. Antidiuretic hormone can also be uh, influenced by pain, by low blood pressure, and by various drugs and medications. The ADH is inhibited by alcohol, which is one reason why if you uh, consume or if you know of someone who likes to consume a lot of alcohol, then you may notice they're constantly running to the restroom. It, part of it is because... It is uh, inhibiting that antidiuretic hormone, so you're releasing even more and more uh, water. You actually may feel dehydrated after uh, imbibing in a lot of alcohol because you're not retaining the water like you should. ADH is also inhibited by diuretic. For those who are not familiar with the term diuretics, are substances, they may be medications, some of them are natural uh, substances. Diuretic, basically, bottom line, it's going to make you pee. It's going to cause the release of water. High concentrations of ADH can cause uh, vasoconstriction, and so it's also sometimes referred to as a uh, vasopressin. This table is showing um, for both uh, the two hormones, the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone, that these are stored in the posterior pituitary. And 
how they're stimulated, how they're inhibited, what the target organism. And it's a chart similar to this that I would certainly recommend that you put together just to help you because you're going to have to be familiar with what hormones are produced where, how they're stimulated, what the target cell is, etc. Now obviously everything we hope works normal, but unfortunately that's not always the case. There are times when you're producing either too much or too little of a particular hormone and then that causes various um, abnormalities and disorders that you may have to deal with. Diabetes insipidus is a hormonal uh, disorder. There is a deficiency of ADH. Why is this? Well, there may be damage to the hypothalamus, there may be damage to the posterior pituitary. Uh, the bottom line is you just are not producing enough ADH. If you are not producing ADH, or very low amounts of it, then that means your body's having a hard time essentially remaining hydrated because there's no signal to tell the kidneys to stop releasing so much water in your urine. So an individual who has diabetes insipidus, um, bluntly, they, they tend to pee a lot. They have a, a lot of water. It's like it just goes straight through them. The danger with this is that they can become dehydrated very quickly, so they must be aware of that. Um, I actually have a sister who suffers from this. Um, it's basically caused by other medication that she is on that it has damaged, uh, and she has a deficiency now of ADH. And although she drinks a lot of your demeanor, she always has a water bottle in hand. She, she was always drinking a lot to remain hydrated. You might say, with the amount she drinks, how could she possibly get dehydrated? It's because she has kidney disease. And uh, um, they're no longer able to function properly to help maintain that proper balance of water and electrolytes. I said the anterior pituitary hormones that I mentioned earlier, um, most of these are going to uh, be part of that cascade or stepwise process of where they become stimulated and then in turn they're going to stimulate other hormones. As you can see, tropic hormones are those that, that regulate the secretion of other hormones. Um, of these six, four of them fall into this category, and as you can see, they are listed here. Uh, the only two that are not are the growth hormone and prolactin. <coughs> Excuse me. Growth hormone, uh, what it is going to do is have direct effects on metabolism. Uh, it triggers the liver to uh, break down glycogen into glucose, glycogen in storage form. It tends to increase blood levels of fatty acids. It's going to encourage cellular protein synthesis. Uh, basically increase that metabolism. It is going to have effects on growth. So it... Uh, Essentially, it's going to stimulate most cells to enlarge, go through mitosis. Uh, its main, although it can have an effect on all cells, its main targets are going to be the bone and skeletal muscles. So this chart shows how you have the production of the growth hormone, how you're going to have both direct and indirect effects, but the end result is that you're going to have increased growth. If you have too much production, higher than normal, it is hypersecretion. In children, this can result in what we call giantism, which is where an individual uh, basically is going to be very tall. There have been recorded uh, cases of where some individuals may be as tall as eight feet. If it occurs uh, in adults, then what you 
end up with a scene is agromegaly, which is overgrowth in the hands, the feet, and the face. If you're secreting too little of the growth hormone in children, this can result in what's known as pituitary dwarfism, where the individual's overall height will be uh, below normal, may only be about four feet. In adults, if this occurs, this hyposecretion, it usually is not going to cause a problem because in an adult, if it doesn't happen until then, you've already reached premature growth, like height potential, so you're not going to notice at that case. So this picture is showing, <coughs> excuse me, um, individuals, the woman of a quote-unquote normal height, and then you can see the other two individuals with uh, the dwarfism versus gigantism. The thyroid stimulating hormone uh, stimulates the secretion normal development of the thyroid. Uh, if you have increased levels of thyroid hormones, then it's going to decrease or inhibit the thyroid stimulating hormone, which makes sense. So you can see on this diagram, it's showing the regulation of the stimulus versus inhibition, the feedback. Negative, in this case, would be negative feedback. Your ACTH, adrenocortical tropic hormone, is going to stimulate the adrenal cortex to release its hormones. The gonadotropins, the follicle-stimulating hormone, and the luteinizing hormone, they are going to be secreted. Follicle stimulating hormone is going to help stimulate the production of the gametes. The gametes are the sex cells, the egg or the sperm. And the luteinizing uh, hormone helps to produce uh, or stimulate the production of other gonadal hormones in females. It's going to help with um, the follicles of the egg and the ovary, it's going to help with the maturing of those follicles. It's going to help with triggering ovulation to occur and the release of estrogen and progesterone. In males, the luteinizing hormone is going to help stimulate the production of testosterone. These two hormones, um, and as true as all the hormones, we're going to, we mention and study the basics of them now, but we're going to see them again. Uh, such as these two when we, at the end of the semester, study the reproductive system. Um, Antidiuretic hormone, we're going to see that again when we study the urinary system, study the kidneys. <coughs> Oxytocin, we're going to see that again when we study reproduction and development. So understand the basics now, and then just be aware you're going to see these again. Both the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone are not uh, present in the blood in uh, children who have not gone through puberty yet. The regulation, the release of them is triggered during puberty and then after uh, puberty. Prolactin stimulates production in females. Uh, increased Estrogen levels tend to stimulate the prolactin, uh, which is why for females, the breasts tend to swell and get more tender during the menstrual cycle. Blood levels of uh, prolactin tend to rise during the uh, end, towards the, the later end of pregnancy. And then uh, a newborn, as it does uh, nurse, that suckling stimulates the release uh, the prolactin, and then that's going to help maintain or continue the milk production. Hypersecretion of prolactin is more common than the hyposecretion of it. Uh, hyposecretion, the only time that's going to cause a problem is if um, a woman with a newborn is wanting to nurse, wanting to breastfeed, and if she has hyposecretion of prolactin, she's not going to be producing probably enough uh, of her own breast milk to, to maintain uh, the health of the, the newborn, so she'll have to supplement with uh, formula or whatever she chooses to use. Hyperprolactinemia is much more frequent. Um, and that is the uh, 
hypersecretion of it. It's often triggered by tumors. Um, what are some signs of it? Well, inappropriate lactation, lack of menses, maybe infertility in females. So once again, here is a table that is summarizing the various hormones. What is regulation? What is stimulating? What is inhibiting? So that regulation of the release of it, what the target organism is, and what is the effect of producing too much or too little of it. Uh, these are all of the hormones that are being secreted by the anterior pituitary. Um, so, so these are the six here, and then you already previously had the two from the posterior pituitary that are stored there, which were actually made in the hypothalamus.